webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Gregory Wallace is trained as a developmental neuropsychologist with extensive experience working with individuals with autism across the lifespan and is an assistant professor of speech, language, and hearing sciences at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Much of his research uses neuropsychological and neuroimaging techniques to elucid elucidate the etiology, developmental course, and long-term outcome of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. You can type your questions into the Q&A section now and throughout the talk. He will answer as many as possible at the end. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Wallace. Thank you very much, Denise. That was very kind of you. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and dive in here. And um, uh, hello to everyone. My name is Greg Wallace. I'm an associate professor at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., as Denise mentioned. And today I'm going to be talking about executive functioning and its real-world impacts across the lifespan in autism. So first I wanted to orient you to my broader approach to understanding and studying behavior. Um, so on the left here, you'll see a simplified uh, depiction of a neuropsychological framework. And my research particularly utilizes uh, cognition broadly defined to serve as a bridge between observed behaviors and brain bases of these behaviors. By taking this approach, we can better understand upstream contributors to behaviors, thereby providing novel and potentially more effective targets for interventions and provisions of accommodations and supports. And this is illustrated um, here in an example of a school-based curriculum called Unstuck and On Target, um, which uh, is a intervention looking at and providing accommodations um, and uh, strategies for addressing executive function difficulties amongst primarily children with autism, but also children with ADHD and other groups. Um, and it's very kind of behavioral in its approach. Um, and there's now a, um, a program called Flexible Futures, which is sort of a developmental upward extension, primarily aimed at transition age youth um, as they transition out of high school um, and into post-secondary, particularly university or college settings. Okay, so <clears throat> I just mentioned neuropsychology and cognition. So today's talk focuses on one aspect of cognition, which is usually termed executive function, though there are other synonyms or closely aligned concepts, such as executive control or cognitive control. Executive function is actually an umbrella term used to describe a set of cognitive processes that help us to regulate or control our behaviors and orchestrate us as we seek um, or plan ahead for future actions and reach our goals. And when I say goals here, I'm talking about simple goals, not like long-term goals like, oh, I'm going to, I don't know, buy a car. I mean, I guess it could be that, but it tends to be more... Um, uh, proximal future goals when we're talking about goals. So <clears throat> the umbrella term of executive function encapsulates numerous aspects of cognition. There's considerable debate as to what aspects of cognition fit under this broader rubric exactly, but the kind of skills most often linked to executive functioning are inhibitory control here at the top, <clears throat> working memory, which is down here, and um, cognitive flexibility, which is right here. Inhibitory control represents one's ability to sort of put on the brakes and refrain from often tempting or what we call prepotent responses. <clears throat> 
working memory involves not only actually remembering information in the short term, but working on that information or somehow working with that information um, as part of reaccessing it. And I'll give more information later on that. And then cognitive flexibility, as it sounds, represents your ability to shift your attention or change your problem solving strategies as needed to accomplish tasks. Uh oh, okay. So to be a bit more concrete, executive functions sort of depicted here in a list on the left, and you can see them, it says executive function here at the top. It helps us to regulate our thoughts, our actions, and our emotions in order to achieve goals. And here are some goals here on the right. And here we have goals around what we often call adaptive functioning or daily living skills, like getting dressed, or it could be more academic, things like completing our math homework, or it could even be more on the social side like engaging in and participating in a group chat. So these executive functions are really, really critical for all kinds of everyday um, activities that we engage in, and therefore they're critically important for our ability to be independent and to function in daily life. Or I should say optimally function in daily life. So again, providing more context and more rationale for the importance of executive function. I want to contextualize why we should care about it. First of all, in the general population, executive function is predictive of real, real world outcomes longitudinally. Um, for example, working memory in early childhood is predictive of reading comprehension and math skills in primary or elementary school. And remarkably, inhibitory control in childhood is predicted of a much later aptitude test scores, like we've got the SAT depicted here, graduation rates, and even rates of drug use and abuse. Does that mean that it's destiny? No. Or that these things aren't malleable or mutable? No. These executive functions are malleable, mutable, and dynamic in terms of developmental course. But the fact that they can be uh, predictive of these things longitudinally sh demonstrates their power and relevance to real world outcomes in the general population. Okay, how about executive function in autism? Let's get to the crux of the matter. Well, executive function difficulties were first linked with autism in the late 1970s and early to mid 1980s. In her seminal work, Dr. Judy Rumsey, who was at the National Institutes of Health, examine performance on a classic measure of so-called set shifting, which is a metric of um, cognitive flexibility, using the Wisconsin card sorting test. Here's what this test looks like. So for the Wisconsin card sorting test, the individual is presented with a stack of cards here in the front. So we're facing it as if we are the individual actually being tested on the Wisconsin cards ring test. Um, and just beyond this stack are individual cards up here at the top. <clears throat> the individual is asked to match each card as it comes up on the top of the stack um, with one of these four above. Importantly, the individual is not instructed how to match them. However, after they make each match, they are provided feedback on whether they were correct or not in their match. So for example, you could match on color. So in the prior slide, we had this single green triangle on a card on the top, and we chose to match that to the pair of green stars. So this color match was done. Now notice we have four red crosses. So we could make a form or shape match. In this case, the four red crosses are matched to the three yellow crosses because we just matched on shape. Finally, you could match on number. Here, the two triangles are matched to the two stars. 
the way the task proceeds is that the individual might, and it's probably likely, to make an incorrect initial match. So if the matching criterion was initially number, as above, not shape, but the individual placed their card with two blue triangles here under the card with a single red triangle, <clears throat> the examiner would respond by saying incorrect or something similar. However, once the correct match is made, the individual usually, uh, sorry, the examiner will indicate as such. They will actually say, um, you know, correct. <clears throat> At that point, the individual usually has to figure out what the rule is or what matching criterion there is and continues to match, in this case, on number. So the next card depicting a red circle would be matched to um, the red, the single red triangle because we're matching on number, right? Um, so you do this repeatedly for a number of trials. But then suddenly, unbeknownst to the examinee or the individual taking the test, the examiner changes the rule. So the whole point here is by changing the rule, you are challenging someone's flexibility because now they have to infer the new rule. Because of course they are not told what the new rule is. You have to infer the rule, so these changes in rule or this shifting set um, is meant to challenge your kind of flexibility and how long it takes the individual to adapt to the changing of the rule and how long they might remain stuck on the old rule are indices or metrics of inflexibility used for this task. So, Going back to that original study from the mid 80s um, by Dr. Judy Rumsey, many of the adults with autism in that study experienced difficulty on this set shifting task, the Wisconsin card sorting task. And subsequent to that study, there have been hundreds and hundreds of these studies examining flexibility in autism <clears throat> using the Wisconsin card sorting test and other types of tests. And indeed, of the executive functions, the ones I mentioned earlier, flexibility is the most frequently linked with autism, which I think many of you agree is in, intuitively makes sense, given that many people with autism have difficulties transitioning from one activity to another. Many find changes in routine um, uh, disconcerting and difficult. Many do not find violations of expectations pleasant, and many are likely to easily get stuck. Okay, now, I've just talked about executive functioning very briefly, and I've talked, I just sort of gave an example of the Wisconsin card swing test as a measure of, or a classic measure of Cognitive flexibility, one aspect of executive functioning. So this is what is usually termed a laboratory-based task, this Wisconsin card sorting test. And these have been the classic um, ways to assess executive function. But there are criticisms of these laboratory-based um, tasks of executive function particularly as to whether it accurately captures the real world difficulties of people with autism or other disabilities who face these executive function challenges. So for example, there definitely are instances where you'll have people with autism, let's say clinically, many, many instances, I shouldn't say like it's some exception, many instances of people with autism who will do fine on the Wisconsin card sorting test, but will report behaviorally, behaviorally many challenges around flexibility, insistence on sameness, these kinds of things. So because of this, there's been an increased emphasis on assessing real world executive function challenges. Um, <clears throat> Executive, executive functions often assess now using questionnaires, both 
other informant, and self-report measures. And this increases what's called ecological validity. These types of measures, these questionnaires and other ecologically valid measures, serve as complements to lab-based tasks as they are often, these two types of the questionnaires and the lab-based tests are often only weakly to moderately correlated with one another. And we have to keep in mind this last point here, there's always a trade-off between faithfulness to the real world experience, i.e., meaning <laughs> that is ecological validity, as opposed to exerting experimental control. So in lab-based tasks, the whole reason we set them up the way we do is we try to isolate specific cognitive functions to understand particularly where the challenges occur when you're completing a task. Whereas in the real world, the real world is very complicated. There can be many reasons you exhibit a particular behavior, um, which could be flexibility. It could be all kinds of reasons, right? Um, so, uh, but th that is the sort of, but that is more faithful to the real world, unlike the, the um, lab-based task. Okay. So one of the most commonly used measures, um, or sorry, questionnaires to uh, measure executive function is the behavior rating inventory of executive function, abbreviated as the brief. The brief provides several scores, including a global executive composite, like a total score. But this composite is in turn composed of subscale scores, including here are, I'm going to just show you eight uh, as an example. This includes inhibition, which I already talked about inhibitory control. This is the same thing, which is the ability to stop one's own behavior at the appropriate time, including stopping actions and thoughts. The item, the example item provided here is does not think before doing, um, which I think we can all relate to. <laughs> Shift, which is uh, the proxy for flexibility is the ability to move freely from one situation to another and to think flexibly in order to respond appropriately to a situation. The example item here is becomes upset with new situations. And lastly on this slide is emotional control, which is the ability to modulate emotional responses by bringing rational thought to bear on feelings. The ex and I know many of us uh, struggle with this, the example item here is overreacts to small problems. Okay. And here's some other domains. One is called initiate, which represents the ability to begin a task or activity and to independently generate ideas, responses, or problem solving strategies. An example item here is, is not a self starter. I mentioned working memory earlier. Working memory is the capacity to hold information in mind for the purpose of completing a task. task. Um, the example here is has trouble with chores or tasks that have more than one step. The next one is planning an organization or plan organize, which represents the ability to manage current and future oriented task demands, such as does not bring home homework assignments or home assignments. Finally, monitor is about one's ability to remain aware of yourself or your task or a task that you're currently completing in order to change your behavior as needed, such as does not check work for mistakes. So I'm gonna quickly breeze through three studies here. Um, and the key question unifying the studies is, is executive function linked with important outcomes in autism across the lifespan? One of these studies is focused on children and adolescents. One is focused on young adults, it's the smallest one. And one uh, is looking all across adulthood um, from early to mid to later adulthood. Also here, I thought I would show you just to uh, fit with the classic literature that I brought up before is the first two studies, not the third one. I thought I'd show you the profile of these real world executive function challenges that people with autism face during childhood and adolescence and during young adulthood. Um, and then in these first two studies, 
I will be looking at the links between executive function difficulties and co-occurring psychopathology, particularly anxiety and depression symptoms. And the reason I focused on those two is because depression and anxiety um, have been shown uh, repeatedly in the literature to have uh, detrimental impacts on outcome for people with autism. In some cases, much more than the, so than the autism itself. Um, so let's take a look at what we found here. Actually, let's look at the sample. First, sorry. So the first study is children and adolescents with autism without co-occurring intellectual disability, ranging in age from five to 18. There are 210 individuals, 83% were male. All participants had parent ratings of, on the brief of their everyday or real world executive functioning. And co-occurring psychopathology was assessed using the child behavior checklist. Like I said, for anxiety and depression. So what did the executive function profile look like? Well, um, what I want to point out here is this is only this is only autistic children and adolescents. And here, 50 is considered the uh, mean score. So higher scores means uh, mean you have more difficulties in these areas. And 65, so it's a mean standard deviation of 50 plus or minus 10 which means that a score of 65 is one and a half standard deviations above the expected mean of 50. So the score of 65 is considered clinically significant. So in other words, you're elevated here. And what you'll see is that across numerous domains, we see that as a whole, these autistic children and adolescents are demonstrating um, clinically significant uh, scores. Um, Fitting with that classic notion of autism, the most elevated score is on shift um, or these um, difficulties with flexibility, but also highly elevated are difficulties in working memory, planning an organization and monitoring, et cetera. So in order to examine the link between executive functioning and um, these co-occurring anxiety and depression symptoms, we utilize regressions. And um, what we did is we used a stepwise regression. I'll show you in just a second. But the model included, just to make sure that we account for possible confounds, we included age, uh, IQ um, as confounds. And then we looked at particularly behavioral regulation and metacognition indices in these studies. That's new to you, but essentially behavior regulation index is um, those things like inhibit and shift. And metacognition are things like working memory and pl planning and organizing. We did this just so we wouldn't have to run a bunch of different tests. And essentially what we found is that these behavior regulation, um, executive function difficulties, so things like inhibitory control difficulties, so not being able to put on the brakes, so to speak, um, and difficulties with flexibility were highly predictive of anxiety symptoms. And these behavior regulation difficulties, as well as the metacognition ones, so things like planning and organizing, and um, working memory difficulties were predictive of depression symptoms. Okay, so that's our pediatric study, if you will. Now we have a much smaller sample of 35 young adults, 31 of whom were um, men with autism without an intellectual disability, average age 21. And uh, like I said, none had an intellectual disability. We again had the brief, but this time it's the adult version. And we had the adult upward extension of, before it was the child behavior checklist, this is the adult behavior checklist for assessing anxiety and depression. All right, now the profile here is a bit different, which is interesting. Uh, it's similar, but different. And I'll explain further uh, shortly. But what you can see, again, we have clinical significance at 65 and we have, uh, some elevations above 65 here 
um, for things like plan organize, um, but we still have really high scores almost across the board. Again, we conducted regression analyses and we controlled for age and IQ. I don't know if I'd explained that very well before, but it's a stepwise regression. And the first thing you do is you control for age and IQ, looking at how age and IQ predict these anxiety depression scores. And then you add in the executive function measures to see what additional variants they're accounting for above and beyond. So you've controlled for these other factors. Um, so I just wanted to say that more concretely since I didn't do a good job before. So this time it was pretty uh, similar. Whereas last time both BRI and MI, so both behavior regulation and metacognition um, predicted depression symptoms. This time it was um, the behavior regulation once just as before predicted anxiety symptoms. So inhibitory control, uh, shifting or flexibility predicted anxiety symptoms. Um, and this time it was more straightforward where it was a distinct metacognition, these working memory and planning organization difficulties uh, predicted depression symptoms in these young adults with autism. Okay, so what do we conclude from these first couple studies? Well, the executive function profile in children and adolescents with autism is very similar on, in one sense, uh, to the executive function profile of young adults with autism. Both show a peak of flexibility problems when you just look at behavior regulation challenges. So this peak difficulty with um, flexibility remains for children and young adults. However, the metacognition problems appear to be more prominent and are retained during young adulthood and autism. So these metacognition problems are more prominent than the behavior regulation ones. And I think a, a pretty straightforward explanation for this is that um, as people transition into young adulthood, you have increased demands and expectations um, that are along the lines of these metacognitive um, skills. So we have more things that rely on your working memory, your ability to plan and organize, you're juggling more things, you have more demands on your life, you have more expectations of you. And also it just turns out that the behavior regulation um, domains, so um, inhibitory control and flexibility, they tend to develop in the general population, they tend to develop faster and they tend to mature earlier than things like working memory and planning and organization. Um, so it could just reflect that. <clears throat> so above and beyond the influence of age and IQ, we do see this consistent pattern where, again, I'm sorry for using all these acronyms, but inhibitory control, inflexibility, predict anxiety symptoms and working memory, playing organization, uh, predict depression symptoms in autism. And this of course suggests that executive function as a treatment target might have downstream positive influences on these co-occurring symptoms that negatively impact outcomes in autism. Okay, so let's get to the third study, which is the newest day that we have. Um, <clears throat> and I find quite fascinating personally. So this one's all about <clears throat> a, the uh, all across adulthood, looking at executive function in autism and its predictors of outcomes. So classically in the literature, and this has even been upheld in this recent review and maybe meta-analysis, but certainly review by David Mason and colleagues. When we, view, when we look at the entire autism spectrum, IQ, or verbal ability has reliably emerged as, a, as one of the strongest or the strongest prognostic marker of adult outcome. What I mean by adult outcome here is things like community-based paid employment and autism. However, as I just suggested and showed, there's growing evidence that executive function challenges play a key role in outcomes for autistic young adults without intellectual disability. 
So we're constraining ourselves a little bit on the autism spectrum. Instead of the full range, we're here, we're just talking about those without an intellectual disability, which is probably somewhere in the order of 60 to 70% of people on the spectrum. So what I'm doing here is I'm in this study is seeking to add to this evidence base by examining the impacts of three aspects of executive function. We've talked about two of them, inhibitory control and flexibility. And then another is emotion regulation. Um, <clears throat> so emotion regulation is what it sounds like. Um, it's our ability to regulate our emotions in order to solve tasks and get through um, our daily lives. So <clears throat> this, is, was, this study was completed in a large group of autistic adults from a wide age range. The adults were recruited by a SPARC, which is the Simons Powering Autism Research Knowledge, and is sponsored by the that is sponsored by the Simons Foundation, not what I'm doing. Um, the sample we recruited was limited to those that spark terms, quote unquote, independent adults. And these are adults who can consent for themselves. Um, and therefore, all of the measures that I'm about to talk about are self-report measures. Okay, so here's the uh, participant characteristics for this study. So this was an online study of autistic adults recruit, uh, who were recruited from across the United States. There were 628 participants who were included. All of them were required to have an existing community-based autism spectrum diagnosis given by a clinical professional. The average age of the autistic adults in the sample was nearly 39 years and the participants ranged in age from 18 to 83 years. The sample is approximately 59% female and from a wide ranging socioeconomic background as reflected in their household income. And 95% of the sample, again, they all had a diagnosis, but 95% of the sample screened positive uh, for autism on the AQ28. Uh, sorry, the short form of the autism spectrum quotient. So the three executive function domains assessed um, were, I already told you, but they were across two different broader measures. The first is the Barclay deficits in executive function scale. Um, inhibitory control and emotional regulation were measured here. An example item of inhibitory control is likely to do things without considering the consequences for doing them. Emotion regulation is something like having trouble calming myself down once I'm emotionally upset. Then we also use the flexibility scale revised, the adult self-report. And an example item is I can't shift gears when I'm told to do so. This time <clears throat> we wanted to be a little more um, faithful to the autistic experience and gauge the actual subjective um, sort of life satisfaction or quality of life of the adults with autism. Um, so the outcome metrics in this current study can be collapsed into two broader constructs. One is subjective quality of life. The other is daily living skills. Subjective quality of life was assessed using two scales. The first is the Hukwal breath, which is the World Health Organization's short form um, quality of life questionnaire. It's 26 items and it has uh, four, uh, four domains. And so it examines how the participant perceives their physical health uh, quality of life, their psychological health quality of life, the quality of their social relationships and the quality of their environment. So physical health is things like, do you have enough energy for everyday life? Psychological health, how satisfied, you, satisfied are you with yourself? Social relationships, how satisfied are you with your personal relationships and environmental, how safe do you feel in your daily life? Then the second quality of life metric is an eight item autism specific quality of life measure that was um, added to the Hukwal breath. And this was developed uh, or co-developed with um, autistic researchers to, it's sort of a hodgepodge of different kinds of measures of quality of life, things like unmet needs are, set, are um, queried. Um, but here's an example item. Can you be yourself around your friends or people you know well? Um, really talking about um, essentially 
being authentically autistic and not having to hide aspects of yourself. And then uh, the measure of daily living skills we use is the self-rated form of the Weissman activities of daily living, which asks participants to indicate their, uh, their independence in completing critical everyday activities. Here it's like washing dishes, banking, et cetera. Okay, so we treated each of these outcome metrics as a dependent variable, which is the circle here at the bottom. And then we entered potentially relevant covariates. So those other ones I described before, we had just age and IQ. These we entered four covariates. We entered age, um, sex assigned at birth, household income, and autistic traits as covariates. And then our so those are covariates, so we're counting for those. And then we were interested, okay, after we've accounted for all four of these, do any of these uh, executive function subdomains, are they additional predictors of whatever outcome it is? And again, our three domains of executive function are inhibitory control, emotion regulation, and flexibility. Um, <clears throat> so... By removing the variance explained by the covariates in step one, this allows us to examine specific relationships between executive function and the outcomes. All right, so this will go pretty quickly through the results. So for physical health quality of life, we found that um, females rated a poor physical health quality of life. Those with uh, higher household income had better physical health quality of life. Those with higher autistic traits had um, poor physical health quality of life. And then for executive functioning, what this is essentially telling us right here, this uh, change in the R square value is telling us that this step two here um, added 7% variance to physical health quality of life. And within this step, it was only emotion regulation that was a significant negative predictor of physical health quality of life. So in other words, if you had more emotion regulation difficulties, you had poor physical health quality of life. All right, now we're turning to psychological health quality of life. Here of the covariates, only autistic traits were significant, higher autistic traits, poor psychological health quality of life. And again, we're getting the same pattern um, for, with executive function, you're going to see this repeatedly for quality of life, which is that more emotion regulation difficulties were related to poor psychological health quality of life. Here, <clears throat> what we find is that with increased age, we find um, poor social relationship quality of life with increased autistic traits, poor social relationship quality of life. And again, um, more emotion regulation difficulties are associated with poor social relationship quality of life. Here, this looks a little strange, but essentially we find that the covariates are the significant predictors um, and none of these emerge. Uh, it's very much the same pattern. Greater household income, you've got better environmental quality of life. More autistic traits, you've got poor environmental quality of life. And then we return back to our usual pattern with autism-specific quality of life where the covariates are all behaving the same <clears throat> and emotion regulation is again negatively predictive. More emotion regulation problems, uh, lower autism-specific quality of life. Okay. Then things completely change when we look at these daily living skills. So again, your independence in completing everyday activities um, like at home or in the community uh, that help you to maintain your independence. Um, now here, a increased age is associated with better daily living skills. These are the same, higher household income, better daily living skills, higher autistic traits, poorer daily living skills. And the part that really differs is now emotion regulation has no nothing to say here. It's being driven by inhibitory control and um, uh, flexibility difficulties. More inhibitory control problems, poorer daily living skills, more inflexibility, poorer daily living skills.
So the conclusion for this study three is that executive function is linked to subjective quality of life and daily living skills um, across adulthood in autism. However, the relationships are not uniform. So-called hot executive functions and hot executive functions refer to executive functions when in a high emotional state, which is what emotion regulation is all about. These hot executive functions are particularly important for people in their subjective quality of life outcomes. In other words, for people's satisfaction um, with their quality of life along various metrics. The so-called cold or cool executive functions, things like inhibitory control and flexibility that we assessed here are particularly key to daily living skills outcomes. And we've shown this before in other studies of children and young adults, the cold EF links to these daily living skills and other adaptive functioning. But what's fascinating is this dissociation and the links between executive function and adult outcome suggests that there might need to be differential intervention approaches, accommodations, and support service provisions based on what your desired outcome improvement is. So whichever one you're targeting might require a differential um, intervention uh, approach. But I want to, you know, give some caveats, right? This is just a, a start. Future research needs to examine more complex models. So for example, poor emotion regulation is linked to increased risk for depression. So it might be that the way this is actually operating is more complex than just, you know, one-to-one. -one. The emotion regulation links to these poor subjective quality of life is actually operating by a depression. So if you've got um, poor emotion regulation, it increases your risk for developing a depression, and that then increases your risk for having a poor subjective quality of life. So we still have a lot of work to do, but it's taking baby steps. Um, and we can think of a similar thing here because guess what? Poor inhibitory control is linked to risk for ADHD. And fascinatingly, ADHD gets, you know, tons of um, research attention and clinical attention for children with autism as a co-occurring condition, but it gets very little attention um, for adults with autism. Um, and I know for a fact that in our sample, we have very high screen positive rates for ADHD in our sample of adults with autism, this um, sample of over 600 people. And flexibility difficulties, that I, as I mentioned earlier, are linked to anxiety. So the executive functions may impact daily living skills, meaning um, Hibbert control and flexibility difficulties may be associated with daily living skills by increased risk for these other psychiatric disorders or symptoms. Okay, so now we're right here at the end. So the overall summary is taken together, the three studies add to and corroborate the critical importance of executive function to real world outcomes in autism. Here I talked particularly about first co-occurring psychopathology, then I talked about subjective quality of life and daily living skills. I will just add, because there was no time to talk about it here, this is a whole other talk at least, is that there are underway, there's intervention development. Um, and uh, there have been several interventions. I mentioned one earlier, uh, no, two earlier, Unstuck and On Target for children and Flexible Futures for um, transitioning high schoolers, for transitioning to uh, university or college. And um, these interventions are using cognitive behavioral approaches to tackle executive function challenges that people with autism are experiencing. However, as always, once you get beyond young adulthood, um, and particularly getting beyond transition age, there's very little research on intervention, trying to assess and um, not assess, sorry, to try to improve executive functions for people with autism. So I'm gonna quickly do acknowledgements. So I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Goldie McQuaid at, at who's at George Washington University and at George Mason University. Um, 
colleagues and collaborators at the National Institutes of Health, including Alex Martin, and collaborators at Children's National Health System, including Lauren Kimworthy and Kara Pugliese. And that last study, like I said, was from Spark. So I am happy to uh, take questions. And I'll leave this up if you have, um, if you would like to contact me. Okay, so Q and A. Oops, there we go. Um, so I'm going to jump here to Christina's questions. Are there any studies that address executive function difficulties in relation to anxiety, depression, specifically, uh-oh, I forgot you can't see all this. Here we go. Specifically, or females with ASD, and if so, are the scores significantly variable? Oh, did I read that wrong? Address in relation to... Oh, specifically for females. So, Christina, I'm sorry. What I would say here is, uh, I hope it's... Denise, is it okay if I answer this verbally, or do I need to type? Oh, okay. Sorry. So they okay. can see. Yeah. Good, good. I'm sorry. I'm just realizing I didn't ask that before. Um, so the answer is, um, I don't know if you, because you asked this question before I got to the third study, I think, maybe. Um, the answer is, uh, yes, there have been studies, and we definitely see a link between executive function, anxiety, depression, in females specifically. This is part of the reason in those regressions, we included sex assigned birth as a, a factor. In other words, is it exerting an influence or not? You, it might even be the case that it's even stronger, that the link between, we don't, I don't know that because um, we haven't tested it, but we definitely see that same linkage between executive function difficulties and anxiety depression, um, particularly between flexibility challenges and anxiety and autism in, uh, um, I should say, autistic females. Mira's asking what level of executive function would you find appropriate to start cognitive behavioral therapy? I think that all depends on the context in which you're uh, operating. So in other words, are your executive function difficulties creating challenges? Are they, can you um, pinpoint them as culprits in part of the challenges for your everyday functioning? If so, then I think it's definitely a good, place to start uh, and target, but it all depends on the individual and where the broader, you know, um, challenges to optimizing your independence, your agency, your daily life functioning are coming from. Um, Susan is asking about programs and interventions available to develop these skills in adolescents and teens. Um, so the the one I mentioned is Flexible Futures, and that one's really focused, like I said, on um, uh, it's a school-based curriculum. But I know that some people will take some of the uh, modules from the curriculum and use them actually individually in therapies. I know they've done that with Unstuck on Target. I imagine they do it with Flexible Futures, too. Um, and that one's, again, targeted particularly, I think a lot of it's targeted around transition, the, uh, the transition process. Okay, how do you make transition smoother? Um, well, uh, Sarah, to answer your question, that's that's uh, interesting. I think that again, that depends on the. In this case, you're talking about kids, so it depends on the child. Um, and I think you know one of the things I really like about Unstuck, for example, is with kids, it's cognitive behavioral. So one it, one things that, one of the things it uh, sort of talks about and targets from the get go is. Um, things like, why should you be motivated to be flexible? So in other words, why should being flexible be important? And what is being flexible? So they, again, very cognitive approach. And so they talk about like the importance of being flex flexible for making friends and keeping friends. Like uh, When they're demonstrating what flexibility is, they actually have a task where they're um, everybody has a rubber band and they're doing different things with the rubber band and showing that how physical flexibility is a nice analogy for um, uh, cognitive and other kinds of flexibility. Um, so yeah, there, so there are all kinds of tasks and modules, curricular-based approaches you can take. 
Um, I'm going to express it for you time now. That, uh, I don't want to, is it Aline? I'm not, I'm scared. I'm going to, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. That's a great point. Um, one way to approach, particularly for executive function issues around planning or problem solving is talking things out, like talking out loud, um, literally talking it out is super important. And it's been used as um, interventions for other groups. And there's some evidence that um, we even have some studies when people, where people with autism, children, yeah, children and adolescents with autism, when they struggle with planning and organizing in a lab-based task, part of the reason is because they're not using sort of their inner monologue to uh, talk through the problem to try to solve it, if that makes sense. Um, so Bonnie asked, so that was Flexible Futures is the name of that. I thought I missed one. I don't know where it went. Oh, Teresa, that's a great point about household income. We did not for this one break it out, but we, we will do that. Like if I went to publish this paper, we would uh, break it out for those living independently versus those living alone. And when we've done other tasks, we've also uh, included other aspects of socioeconomic status. But that's an excellent point because household income is very blunt. It's very different when you're living at home, um, let's say with your parents or you're living in um, some other uh, group setting or a sibling or whatever, or a partner versus with um, if you're living alone resources wise. Um, and somebody asked, could depression be an aggravating, could be aggravating executive function challenges? The answer is absolutely. This isn't meant, in spite of the way I presented this, this is not meant to be a linear relationship um, or sequential where it's all executive function driving the depression symptoms. These things could go in reverse and, um, and they could be a feedback loop. That's a great point. Um, uh, someone's asking about recommendations on after the diagnosis of anxiety and um, what they could do to provide to reduce anxiety well that's super complicated and I feel like I'm not the right person to answer that question I'm mostly talking about anxiety vis-a-vis -vis executive function and how addressing executive function challenges can help to reduce anxiety or vice versa. So you, the whole idea is, you know, typically what we've done clinically is to address, just address anxiety. The idea is by um, uh, finding another target where we intervene or another place to intervene like executive function, it will have downstream positive influences on other aspects of behavior. That's, that's why we're showing this linkage. The idea is to link these behaviors to show why they're important and how they could have um, uh, these downstream positive impacts. Um, so, and that's, that is some of what we've seen. So I know that, for example, in the Unstuck and on Target, the first trial that was run, they found downstream positive impacts on social skills and social functioning. So um, when flexibility and planning were improved in these kids with autism, it also improved their social behaviors. Um, Let's see. Uh, you asked about sharing this article, study three. There is no article because this is unpublished data, uh, but I'm happy to share it with you um, when I do. And I can obviously share some of these slides, et cetera. Um, someone's asking about um, uh, so someone's asking about these measures vis a vis neurotypical measures of functioning vis-a-vis um, -vis neurodiversity. Uh, Steve, you're asking about this. I think, um, I don't, well, some of these measures are neurotypical, but some of these I would not say are neurotypical per se measures. So for example, like subjective quality of life, that is not um, neurotypical in the sense of, I think where people think neurotypical outcomes come into play is when they use so-called objective ones, right? To say, here's what your life should be like, because, and this isn't just for, let's say, 
uh, neurodivergent groups versus neurotypical, it's for other groups too. Like let's say um, LGBTQ, like before, you know, there was marriage equality, uh, you know, people would say, well, what you do, the, the objective outcomes you should be striving for are uh, marriage and uh, this many children and this and that. And if you aren't doing that, and people would literally use those as outcome measures and whether you had good or poor outcomes. Um, but that's the whole idea of the subjective. And I could be wrong here, but I think the whole idea of the subjective is to say, you know, my perception of my life doesn't matter. L let's take physical health. I could use objective measures. So I could have high blood pressure. I could have high cholesterol. I could have diabetes. And objectively, that could be considered a poor quality of life. But subjectively, I could say, I'm fine with my health. All of these things are regulated. I'm doing fine. I'm totally fine with that. They're completely separate kinds of measures. So I don't think that neurotypical um, overlay gets there. Now, having said that, your example is particularly on the executive function side. And it is certainly possible that some of this... Um, some of these measures might have a neurotypical lens on them. So that's a good question on the executive function side. But I will say that at least my experience with um, autistic co-researchers, because I have um, numerous autistic students and co-researchers in my lab, is that most of these measures aren't things that trip them up in that way. But I, I completely agree with you. And I think it's a super important point to keep that in mind when looking at standards, if you will. Um, someone's asking is, is lack of flexibility in autism, is it not as common with severe ADHD? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, when we think about ADHD and in, in the, oh, well, wait, I'm not sure if we're talking about ADHD in autism or just ADHD in general. Um, Flexibility difficulties can be present in ADHD, but their flexibility is more characteristic of, flexibility difficulties are more characteristic of autism than ADHD, whereas in ADHD, you're more likely to get these characteristic uh, difficulties with inhibitory control. And, but it's not like a rule, you know, like it's not a hard and set rule. Both groups can have these difficulties. I don't know if that helped or not. Um, that's a good question. Is executive function testing typically part of autism evaluations? I would say that often it is, but I think it depends on who the clinician is that's completing the autism evaluation. Um, I would say with psychologists, it often is. And of course, the diagnostic criteria for autism include aspects of behavior that are akin to or related to some aspects of executive function. So things like, quote unquote, insistence on sameness. Um, are linked with um, executive function. Um, so someone's asking for a real world example. Unfortunately, I don't have time to give you an example or an exercise, um, but I do think if you look online, you could probably find some and there definitely are with, I'm not telling you to buy the curriculum, but Unstuck and other, you could probably find some examples online where they've used uh, these types of curricula or other cognitive behavioral approaches to help to teach and model um, shifting and flexibility. Someone asked if medication is helpful for emotion dysregulation. Short answer, definitely. Um, that can be very helpful for some people, which is part and parcel of things like, you know, um, actual uh, depression, anxiety uh, diagnoses. Um, so <clears throat> obviously it depends on the person, the nature of the emotion, dysregulation, et cetera, et cetera. But in theory, it can be, but it depends on how that is related and expressed in the uh, person. Whoops. Um, a fascinating question. Um, <clears throat> uh, so how can you differentiate ADHD and autism? Well. Uh, there's lots of different ways, but of course, I think in some ways there's a point at which, you know, these things are, are highly co-occurring. So in children, it might be as much as 50, so 50, sorry, let me be clear, 50% of folk, kids with ASD 
could meet criteria for ADHD. It might be slightly lower, um, but it's really high. And so it can be complex to do that, but it's just based on developmental history. A lot of times it's based on the nature of any social communication challenges. What's the root of those social communication challenges in um, autism versus ADHD to help make that delineation? Um, <clears throat> I don't have a lot to say here about older people with ADHD and autism, but we are looking at that in our sample. And it's, uh, I'm fascinated to see um, how that plays out in terms of number one, we do have data suggesting that people with ADHD and autism have poor quality of life than those with autism alone. Um, I'm not sure yet because we haven't looked at the data with executive functioning. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you ever so much. And thank you for the questions. They're great. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. All right. Have a great day and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you very much.